Hebrews chapter 10, 21 to 24. Yes. Sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God we can, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to act of love and of good works. Amen. Okay, the Bible is talking about motivating one another. Each time we talk about motivating one another onto good works, the only good work is the work that Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary. So when we talk about motivating one another onto good works, we talk about sharing the good news. Now, today we want to look at digital evangelism. Can anyone in just 30 seconds tell us what do you think is digital evangelism? Let's make it interactive. What is digital evangelism? Just as we have analog, what is digital evangelism? I will call names. Yes? Okay. Um, preaching the word of God through social media, digital ways, WhatsApp, and all of us. Okay. Now, another, do, do anybody have any different opinion? No different opinion. Now, do you think that it is right to evangelize the gospel through digital means? Or do you think it is wrong? Is it a right thing to do? Okay. Now, I remember in 1996, 97, um, there's that church in Nigeria, a Pentecostal church. I don't want to mention name. But there was a revolution that came in the church and um, the general overseer, the founder, was against using television. In fact, I remember they said it was a tool of the devil. Um, I know a brother who got the zeal and came to my village and was busy destroying televisions. He will tell you it is what the devil is using to uh, spread bad news and all manner of that. Interestingly, that church today, they own a TV channel. Praise the Lord. You know, the same people that were against TV. You probably know the church I'm talking of. It's one of our fathers of faith. But I believe that was the level of understanding that they operated in at that time. All right? But now we understand that the world is moving. The world is progressing. There are things that I don't know. That if you tell these children now, they will do it better than myself. Why? We are in the time of technology. Now, in theology, there's what we call dispensations. For instance, we are in the sixth dispensation, which is the dispensation of grace. Now, the truth is that at every season, at every dispensation, there are things that God uses. Interestingly, the same thing that God makes use of is the same thing that the devil uses as well. Praise the Lord. So while we talk about digital evangelism, it is not uncommon to also identify that the devil uses the same digital means to also evangelize. Praise the Lord. Now, by introduction, as of January 2020, the population of the world stood at 7.7 .7 billion. Now, we have over 5 billion persons who were already using smartphones. Internet users were more than 4.5 billion. And then over 3.8 billion were active on social media. Now, statistics shows that every minute, over 1 million people log on to Facebook. 3.8 million such as Google, that's per minute. And then 4.5 million videos are viewed on YouTube and 347,000 scroll Instagram. I believe if not all of us, almost everyone here has access to smartphones and social media. Now I'm going to say something because as much as we are talking about digital evangelism, it's also important to know that for us Christians, we're also using it in the wrong way. I have my reservations about digital evangelism. Let me give a clear example. Today, if I ask everybody seated here to raise their Bible, you will realize that over 70% don't have paper Bible. We don't have the hard copy Bible because we have phone. My baby is raising her own Bible in trade. That's good. Many persons have gotten used to mobile phone Bible. 
and we think it's advancement. Now, I was a victim because at some points now, I have my iPad, I could click on the Bible, I have my phone, I could click on the Bible, but I realized something. Each time I'm reading the Bible, maybe WhatsApp message pops up and it's an interesting message. You just scroll down, let me just read the message. You know, you are reading the message and you forgot that you were actually doing something with the Bible. So, on the other hand, it's important that while we do digital evangelism, let us not allow the world of um, technology to carry us away. Since 2020 till today, I can confidently say in this church, every Sunday we have not less than seven to 10 persons online because they feel comfortable. Ah, instead of me coming to church, I can join via Zoom. It's not peculiar to this church all across the world. I remember talking to my sister and she said, ah, say that, uh, bros, don't worry, I don't go to church, I follow online. But Bible speaking in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, said, do not neglect the gathering of brethren. So digital evangelism somehow is very good, but let us use it intelligently. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible is clear that anyone who has a personal encounter with Jesus is called to be his witness. In Mark chapter 16, verse 14 through 15, when Jesus was talking, and we understand, he will say, go ye into the world. So Bible will always talk about an encounter. If you have personal encounter, it is also required that you also tell people about Jesus. Now, this is the truth. If you are married, for those of you who are married, and you are, your wife gave you a nice food, you will definitely appreciate it. And any day people are talking about those that their wife cook nice food, you'll be proud to say, I think my wife cooks better food than your wife. So you are giving a testament of what you have experienced. Now, this is the same thing that is applicable to the gospel. Our calling on to salvation does not end with us. Now, imagine if the 12 apostles received the spirit of God and they said, because we have the spirit of God, let us remain in the upper chamber all the days of our lives. Of course, intentionally, that was their plan. They had actually planned to remain there and be praying, be singing because they were happy. But God saw that if I allow these people, the gospel will not get to the utmost part of the earth. And immediately he persecuted them, he struck the apostles and the gospel spread. All right, so you becoming a Christian does not end with you. It's good. Bible recorded we all go to heaven, but there are people that will have stars in their crowns. Praise the Lord. And scripture said, who are they that are wise? If you read in Daniel chapter 3, it is those who turn many to Christ. They are the people that God regards as the wise ones. So now, with the emergence of new digital technologies and internet or social media platforms, Digital evangelism is an effective means of reaching the world with the gospel. So it's a very clear way of reaching the world with the gospel. Now, our first outline is, what is the biblical view of digital evangelism? Does the Bible support digital evangelism? Yes, the Bible supports it. Now, simply put, digital evangelism is about strategically and intentionally using the internet. Now, underlying the word strategically and intentionally, and social media platforms through communication gadgets and other digital devices to preach the gospel or share a crystal experience with others. Now, it's something that you must do intentionally and strategically. But please, I realize that very many Christians, like I said, the use of digital evangelism is becoming abusive. There are people, brethren, that I have blocked on my WhatsApp because every morning, the only thing you send me is long message of Bible. You know, it becomes very boring. I don't know for others, but I know a sister that I just clicked block button. You will not ask me how I'm doing. You will not talk to me for over one year. And you know me, I'm, I've not backslidden by the grace of God. But you are just bombarding me with, um, what is the title of that every morning? You don't use me to practice being a pastor, actually. What, what am I saying? You'll be strategic. There are, there, that's how you begin to make something. It becomes boring even to those who are following you. 
You know, there are people that on their start to save every morning, it is clip of Apostle Joshua Selman, it is clip of uh, Papa Dadijio, da it is clip of uh, Bishop Oyedepo, even some persons will get out of in your status. So be strategic. You cannot view my status in, maybe in one week I might even not talk about Christ. But there are wisdoms that I will reveal. I'm saying it because some of us Christians, you know, there, there's that message that they will circulate they will say if you don't circulate it to five persons you will die how many of you have received those messages if you send me that message i'll click block button because that is not the gospel that is a threat <laughs> you are threatening people with your mobile device so the gospel should not be a threat so you have to be strategic about it you have to be very strategic about it now i remember something happened you know, I met with someone and we got talking and she, she told the person, another person about me. The next person, the next thing that person did was to go on social media and check my name. And when the person saw the name and I called back and said, this person is a pastor. But you wouldn't go there and see me quote too many scriptures. But you cannot go through my social media platform and you'll be carried away. You, will not, you cannot get lost if you're on my social media platforms. So be very strategic. So the Bible is not against it. However, you must do it intentionally. You must do it strategically. Let your media help in propagating the gospel. Let it not kill the gospel of salvation that you have received. Like I said, very simple example. Check yourself. You don't have Bible. Because if I ask you, you will say, in fact, in my phone, I have uh, many translations. Ah, Brother Joshua, don't worry. But please, remember, do not be carried away. Now, what does it do? It helps to bridge the gap that physical wars could create. Now, there are people that physically you will not be able to reach them. Praise the Lord. Now, through this digital means, the gospel gets to them. There are places in the world, I remember one of our fathers of faith, a Reverend Dr. Mopai, you know, in the time where it was taboo to take the gospel to some countries, I think he mentioned Afghanistan. Um, in the early 1990s, it is, in fact, it's a taboo. If they see you with the Bible in Afghanistan or in some of these um, other of our brothers, you are likely going to face death penalty. So, but today, I think such thing is no longer a problem because media is reaching those places. By chance, somebody will click on television and you see that the Jew preaching, even if you don't like gospel. So it's a digital means. Now it has breached the gap of places that people cannot get to physically. You're able to reach those places. Now let's read Acts of the Apostles chapter one and verse eight. It's a popular scripture, but I want us to read the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1 and verse 8. Then 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, 17 and 18. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1 and verse 8. If you are there, you can read. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8. Next person, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 18. Okay, now, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in all Samaria, and unto the utmost parts of the earth. Now, the question is, now that you have received Christ, you are in UK, are you able to get to Judea? No. Are you able to get to Samaria? No. Are you able to get to the utmost part of the earth? No. But with media, you can reach those places. Now, I remember back in those days when families want to reach uh, their people in Lagos, they will send mail through the post office. Imagine that you want to tell somebody that the father died. By the time the person receives the post, it's one week, the man has been buried. And it's that day that he's reading that the father is dead. But with media, you realize it's very easy. You can easily pick your phone and call somebody. This is what the gospel also wants us to do through the media. By media, we can reach the utmost parts of the earth. There are places you cannot go to. There are people, like I said, there are classmates, for instance, that you will never meet in life. Hallelujah. There are your friends that you were close friends, you will never reach them. And maybe this is the point. When all of you were friends, you were not born again. Hallelujah. And you know that all of you were doing everything 
So, and you cannot reach them to share the gospel with them physically. But now that you have received salvation, you can reach them via the mobile. So you can as well call them and say, bro, I've left that life. Oh, I am no longer in that system. Praise the Lord. So I'm no longer in that system. You can now share the gospel with them. So the question is, are you doing that? Now, obviously, Jesus Christ did not follow merely one method of spreading the gospel. This is our Messiah we are talking about. Now, at some point, if you read in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, when he was talking um, to some people, he entered Peter's boat. Now, Peter's boat at that point became a platform for him to share the gospel. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Two, the Bible said that is the teaching of the beatitude. He got to the mountains. So Jesus had several means of sp spreading the gospel. Either he's on Peter's boat or he's in the mountains or he's in the desert. Those were platforms at that time. Now, the platform we have in our generation is the digital platform. So are you using it to reach people or are you using it to threaten people? Like I said, if you don't share this message, you will die. Send to five persons and uh, uh, you will make heaven or you become a millionaire. Those are threats. It's not evangelism. Now, while Apostle Paul traveled from city to city and wrote many letters using the press media available during the era of Reformation, this means that we should study, plan, and devise methods. Now, devise methods to reach people. You have your own way of reaching people. So there, there is actually no um, methodic way that you will use the media to share gospel. So it is up to you to devise, how do I reach my WhatsApp to reach people? Is it by through my status? Is it through my daily post? Is it through my Facebook? Is it through my Instagram? Now, uh, you know, you'll be surprised that you go on Instagram and you see people advertising their hair. You see people advertising lots of things and very few persons advertise Christ. I think it was on the 7th of June Pastor Nathaniel Bassi made a post and said, everybody should use Jesus. I don't know either you, you put it as your profile picture. You know, sincerely, immediately I opened my WhatsApp. Everywhere was Jesus. I opened Instagram. What came to my mind is, I beg, <laughs> rapture, has rapture started? That was on. So now you realize that in a twinkle of an eye, it spread all over the world. People were spreading, posting Jesus on their status, on their DP. That's how it happens. So the little gospel you will share can reach nations. Hallelujah. And now believe me, there is an insight of the gospel, of the Bible that you have that no other person has. When we talked about uh, deepening in spiritual knowledge, I did say something last two Sundays that there are things that God will want to tell you personally. He will not tell another person to tell you. So there is something you might just read a verse of the Bible. There's a knowledge that is just peculiar to you. And you realize if you share it, someone gets blessed. Hallelujah. Now let's go to our second outline. How do we optimize the digital world for evangelism and discipleship? So now let me ask us, how will you use your digital means to preach the gospel? We are all on social media. So I want somebody or maybe one or two persons to tell me, what best way do you think you can use the social media or any digital means to preach the gospel? Yes. Uh-huh. Somebody is talking. Or nobody is talking. How can we optimize the digital world for evangelism and discipleship? How? Um, I think we're using social media. Like uh-huh. Nobody is talking. Sorry, I'm in line. Good afternoon. Uh-huh. Brokeni. How do you use your digital way to spread the gospel? Hallelujah. You can be a content creator. You can be a writer. Well, um, I'll use my wife as an example. She's got um, a YouTube page. You know, people look forward to a post on, um, on different aspects of life. You know, so you can be a content creator. You can be a writer. And, you know, people look forward to your post and are, are blessed by whatever you post on social media. Praise the Lord. Okay, perfect. Is there any other means? Do you have any other means that you use? It's good that he used um, the wife. So, madam, give us your, your YouTube channel so that we will be watching. Praise the Lord. 
So do you have any other means? Okay, now you can use, I believe that some of you will even post your, you know, daddy said something last Sunday and uh, since he said it on Sunday, I've not uploaded any picture on my status because you are posting your picture in England and your village people are seeing it. Since that Sunday, I said I'm not posting any picture again. <laughs> you know, some of you advertise your new clothes, right? You know, you, you buy new clothes and you want people to see, oh, I bought a new shirt. Oh, I bought a new suit. You know, you advertise your hair. It's not wrong to also advertise Jesus. But like I said, do it strategically with wisdom. Let it not, people should not get bored with your spiritual nuggets. People should not get bored. That's how you do it and people get bored. All right. Now, there are positive aspects of social networking. You can use the Facebook. You can use the Instagram. You can use Google Meet. You can use any method. You know, of course, recently I, I entered Bible study with someone and, you know, we have a special day. We just call ourselves on WhatsApp and we just read maybe a chapter of the Bible and we discuss it. It happens like that. I belong to so many groups of such. So you can use any of this media as a way to spread the gospel through social networking. Now, it has become, it has overcome great hurdles and barriers to penetrate through the borders of the most hostile communities of the world. Like I gave instances, there are places that you cannot go to. In fact, in the country we are coming from, there are some parts of Nigeria, I tell you the truth, you cannot enter with boldness to preach Jesus. You know, some of you have not been to some hinterlands. I went for rural rugged when we did the NYS in Niger State. When we got to that village, it's shocking to know that there are people that don't even know the name Jesus. And those places, in fact, they don't even have network. I know a man that told us in that village when we got talking, he said, I don't know what you people are talking about that I don't know of any other religion. It is just that they are own. But the truth is, in such places, while the world is developing, network or advancement gets there. Once in a while, they will read it on social media. They will see it on digital platform. So there are places you cannot reach. The gospel must get there. Praise the Lord. Now, for Christians, social media sites can be productively harnessed for kingdom expansion. Social media allows us to reconnect with people we may have lost contact with and open new avenues for sharing Christ. Now, let's read Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read verse 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some A's but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Like I said, there is a negative side of this digital evangelism. And one of the negative side is that since I came back since October last year, we have not come for Bible study here. And it is one thing I looked up to in 2019 because I already know I'll finish from library. If I'm not going on night shift, I'll come for Bible study. Somehow, the digital is as well taking us away from meeting as brethren. Hallelujah. Although we are utilizing it, but please, I'm still saying, let it not take away the gathering of brethren. The Bible said, do not forsake. Hallelujah. So we cannot be writers. We cannot be content creators. We cannot be publishers. It is no longer the duty of the pastors to preach the gospel. It's no longer the, if you go on Facebook, there are a lot of channels. I clicked on Twitter like maybe three weeks ago and I just saw somebody on live. I joined them and I realized they were talking about marriage and relationship. You know, many platforms, you can create your own channel. Some of you are creating your channel to advertise your business. It's fine. But even while you are doing your marketing, let people also know your stand. Praise the Lord. So that way you are able to reach many for us. So making us more church members can be missionaries. So the presence of the church online will be stronger and more people will know of the saving love of Jesus. Any question before the conclusion? Any question? Digital evangelism. It's something that we all know. Even though some of you don't want your classmates to know that you are a church person. That's why you don't post on WhatsApp. You don't want people to know that you are a church person. 
Yes, ma'am. Because an addition, actually, I just wanted to find out. As you said, many of us, you know, we advertise, we advertise um, our business, but we don't advertise price. Mm -hmm. So I want to find out how many people have smartphone here. Just lift up your hands. We have a smartphone. If you have the one that is shattered smartphone. like my own, you can still lift it. <laughs> okay. How many people? All of us. Everybody. Okay. Do you all have pastor's numbers? Okay. As we're sitting now, I just want to challenge everyone. Can you just tell us the platform that you would like to have? Any social platform that you would need, you want to advertise Christ on? Can you text it to Pastor now? We've, we've I just I said WhatsApp, um, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook, Twitter. Just text it to Pastor now, please. It's a challenge. Okay. Do you understand my question? Okay. Do you all have smartphones? Do you all have Pastor's number? Okay. Right now is a challenge to everyone. Just text Pastor, the digital social media platform that you would love to, to be advertising Christ. I pity you if you don't have daddy's number. If daddy you don't have daddy's number, do you have Joshua's number? Or oh, daddy's number? Text it. Let's text it now. Daddy and that will now. be the platform that we will be using to advertise Christ. Even if it's just one scripture a day. You know, he's talking about digital evangelism and discipleship everyone that has a smartphone should be discipling someone you cannot come to this world and go back the same way without anybody saying when you die oh sister Yinka, you know did something on the platform i can never forget through her i gave my life to christ you need to do something in here there's rivers flowing of what so I hope you have texted pastor. How many people have texted pastor? Just your choice of your choice of social social media my platform. Choice. Your choice, okay. your choice. I'll give you. But my I'm friendship. challenging you today. You know you need to advertise Christ as a Christian. Don't stop. This is where we are hiding is is gone. Don't hide your faith anymore. Because if you are ashamed of Him on that day, He will be ashamed of you. God forbid. You don't know who you are going to touch. Anyone has done it? Have you texted Pastor mm -hmm. for that, Joshua? Mm -hmm. Only four people. Please raise up your smartphones. Raise up your smartphones. But well, Adira, thank you. But well, Lumide, thank you. Who else? Network. Which net? No network <laughs> problem here. But they give them the net. Give them the Wi-Fi for the church, please. I'm sure who else the best to do that? Who else have you gotten, Pastor? Do you get anyone? No. Yeah, how many people now? How many people now? Okay. Are you sure, Pastor? <laughs> if you have done yours, let me just raise your hand. Be honest. Don't let us say. Okay, wonderful. Only five people. What are so many people? <laughs> how many people have done yours yes, now? Most of them. Okay, okay, please. All you need to do is just honestly, just a message. Just send it out. Even if it's just once a week or twice a week that God has allowed you. Something that you have, when you do your devotion, there will be something that will come up, you know, from the word. Just text it out to people. Believe you me, you will start having discipleship. And when you get to heaven, it is these same people that will be in next door to your mansion. But if you don't disciple anybody, uh, come and see what we have about Brother, Brother, Emmanuel. Brother Emmanuel. You'll be weeping. People that he has touched his life one way or the other. So I, I don't know how many people have you touched their lives that can actually testify, you know, to the goodness of God in your life. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for that challenge. I'm going to be following your social media platform. I'm going to be following you. Thank you. God okay. bless. Okay, before another, if, if any other question will come by Wednesday, but there's something I want to say before we summarize, because I wanted to say, talk about discipleship. Evangelism is different. Discipleship is different. Now, one way that the media should help us, the digital means should help us, is something that is lacking in the church, even in the UK and in Nigeria. And what is it? Visitation. If you read the Bible in the time of Paul, in the time of Peter, how they were doing it is that there are times they'll go to host a fellowship in a brethren's house. It's just a way of reaching out to brethren. So it's not necessarily getting new members to Christ is also helping to keep the people we have in the church. You can do visitation through your digital phone. You can just call somebody, oh, I didn't see you in church. I hope you are fine. That settles it. 
With that, you are reaching out to someone. Somebody might be falling off faith. Just by that call, you are bringing that, you know, somebody might be feeling like, oh, the church don't care about me. Oh, nobody remembers me. Just that call that somebody just called will bring the person back to life. Praise the Lord. Now, in conclusion, digital evangelism should be incorporated with traditional forms of evangelism. It does not replace traditional methods such as one-on-one -on -one mass tract evangelism. If you read in Matthew chapter 28, 19 to 20, I will read from my head. Jesus speaking said, go ye into the world. Be fruitful. He said, preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. Let the gospel be preached into all the world. And like I said, you don't even have train money to go to London to share tracts, but you have free Wi-Fi that your father or your mother is paying for broadband. So you can use it to call the person in London. You don't have money to print tracts, but you can call someone on WhatsApp. It must not be a new member. It can be an existing member in the church. I just call to check on you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Let the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Every other question will come on Wednesday. Every other question will come on Wednesday. If you have any question on digital means of evangelism, join us on Wednesday. Let us pray. In Jesus' name. Our faithful Father wants to thank you for the grace to share in your word. And thank you, Lord, because every means, every platform belongs to you. We ask all this day, Lord, do not allow the devil to use these opportunities that you have given us to take men away from Christ. Let us use it, O God, to return many unto you. We ask, Father, in any means that we will need, any platform that we will use, as men will read it, they are not reading our updates. Lord, they are reading the power of God. Bible said that the word is life. And I ask, oh God, let the life of your word in all our social media platforms, as people see us, as people read it, Lord, let them feel your presence in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, is there anyone that has lost courage to share the gospel? I pray for such one, oh Lord, be their courage in the name of Jesus. It is not the wrong thing to do. And therefore, Lord, we ask, give us the grace. Lord, give us the grace. It is the wise that turns many to Christ. Therefore, Lord, we are joining the camp of the wise. Thank you because only you will do it. We'll come against every forces of the media age that will want to work against the gospel. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we'll come against them. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please, I want us to occupy the benches in the feet. In the front, you are all welcome in Jesus' name. Please, can we just take a step forward? As we take a step forward, God, we are pleased in Jesus' name. Let's occupy the front seat and let the late commas take the back seat, please. Please, thank you as you do that, please. Can we move forward, please? Occupy the front seat. It's an order from the ministers of God, please. Can we occupy the front seat in front of you? Can you take hands? Can you occupy this? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Even the teenagers, you can do the same. Occupy the front seat in front of you, please. Thank you, thank you. It's an order from the minister of God, and the Bible says, as we respect those in authority, God will bless us in Jesus' name. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want you to turn to your left or to your right and welcome someone in the presence of God this morning. Tell them they are welcome. For us to see ourselves today is the grace of God, is His mercy that we are not consumed. To him be all glory and adoration. Just begin to talk to God concerning your life. Just begin to thank him for giving you another new day. You are in the sanctuary of the Most High God. You are not in the mortuary. You are in his presence. You are not in the hospital. Some have feet, but they cannot move their feet. Some have hands, they cannot move their hands. Some have eyes, they cannot see. Some cannot walk without medication. But you are here today. You walk into the presence of God with your feet. You came here and you can open your
your mouth. You can smile. Some people take medication for them to smile. Some people take medication for them to even feel things around them. But we are here today in His presence. Because of His grace, we are not consumed. Because of His mercy, we are not consumed. Indeed, we are so grateful to you, Lord. We worship your name, King of Kings, Lord of Lord, Prince of Faith. No one like unto your name. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to say we are grateful to you. We are grateful, oh Lord. We are grateful, oh Lord. For all you have done for us. Yeah. 
Follow the convention. It's my season of jubilee. And if you follow through the convention, you, you know this season is a season of restoration. It's a season of possessing those things that are lost. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor confidently now. Tell him or her, it's my season of jubilee. It's my season of jubilee. If that neighbor is not responding, you move to the other neighbor and tell him or her confidently that it's my season of jubilee. I did not respond there. Okay. How many of us follow the convention? The Redeemed Christian Church of God Convention. How many of us do it? I mean, it was a great time in God's presence. I don't know. Indeed, it is a season of jubilee because we are taking over. We are moving our world, and all things that have been lost have been restored in the name of Jesus. In that light, we will be praising God this afternoon. We will be dancing and we'll be saying thank you, Jesus, for a successful convention. Hallelujah. 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 Mm. Say, so Lord, you are so good. Why you are kind Lord you are wonderful My God You are kind Lord you are kind Lord you are kind Lord you are kind Lord you Thank <laughs> you. 
I do not want to attract people to plant in this person. Because the time is very important that we need to plant the Lord. We need to clear our hands to the Lord. Our body is the temple of God. It starts our praises. And it brings to our hands to plant the Lord. So, let's go back to our question. To the right, to the left, to the left. For the universe, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Open your eyes, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Holy of Holies, and Jehovah Shalom, who is the one who our needs. So we are aiming in saying, Father, we know you. So we do it together now. Father, we know you. We know you. We know you. We know you.
children of the church, we love you more than me. Begin to tell God how much you love me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, gracious Father. Thank you this afternoon. Be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. If you are the highest person, if you know you are the most excited person in, in this house, I just want you to say a big hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God is good. I always look forward to coming to church on Sunday. Because why? I don't go to club. This is the only place I come to dance. So I'm always looking for nothing can take me away from the presence of God by His grace. Hallelujah. We are happy to see every one of us this afternoon. Tell your neighbor you are welcome in the presence of God. You're welcome. We want to use this opportunity to welcome everyone. If you know today is your first time coming to Open Heaven Christian Center, our CCG Open Heaven Christian Center, Luton. Please, we want to recognize your presence. We so much appreciate your coming. We want to recognize you just by standing up, if you don't mind, please. You just want to know your name. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Welcome to our meeting. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Righteousness. Peace. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, please, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Life and peace and our God. Righteousness. Righteousness. Don't you want to be a part of this kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of this kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of this kingdom? Come on. Praise the Lord. You're welcome, sir. This is RCCG Open Heaven Christian Center, Lutum. Our slogan is, this is where Jesus worship. This is the resident. Jesus is our resident pastor. Here is where he worship always. And he visits other churches. Praise the Lord. You could testify by what you've seen. All right. Thank you. Can we know your name, please, sir? Ajibola. Oh, you're welcome, sir. We're happy to see you in our midst. Please, Ma, what's your name? Okay, Najo. Okay, Bamalayo. I could see. Okay, Oluwa Daji. Sorry for not pronouncing it well. You're welcome, Ma. We are happy to see you this afternoon. Welcome. Please, Ma, what's your name? Okay, please, you're welcome. God bless you. Is anyone online worshiping with us for the first time? Anyone on Zoom? Please, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome, ma. We are happy to see you. And we pray that you co we continue to come. The Lord will meet you at your point of need in Jesus' name. The Lord who has ordered your footstep here will surprise you and visit you everywhere you need help in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, we, there's a series we started two weeks ago with Daddy, and you know, we've been speaking about you know uh, generational causes breaking free from all of that. But there's one, one part, just the part that can break us and set us free from that, and that's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus broke us loose from every shade. And the Bible says, He who the Son has set free is free indeed. And if you are to be free indeed, really trust and believe in the name of Jesus. This morning, we've come to tell you that there's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Do, 
There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Jesus, amen. Let us clap for our choir and our instrumentalists. Theme for this month is dismantling household altars, and we thank God for a perfect Jubilee convention 70 years of convention in Nigeria. I hope and I pray that each one of you tapped into it in the name of Jesus. Uh, Brother Jibola, we welcome you. God bless you. You are not here by mistake. God definitely ordered your steps. Please, who invited you? Or how did you get to know the church? God, God sent you here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sister Ladu. Fantastic. Okay. Sister Ronke. Same thing online. Let us clap for the media department. Let us clap for the media department. So, but uh, Jibola, what do you do in Luton? Are you studying? Are you working? Are you here with family? Yeah, but, um, um, I don't want to get oh. Okay, but you live in Luton. Okay, which part of Luton do you live? Okay, L U two. Okay, okay. And Sister Latin, where do you, do you, are you here studying with? Okay, University of Hertfordshire. What what are you studying? 
business. Okay, business analysis and consultancy. Okay, in Hartford, in Hartfield. Okay, that's fantastic. We have about 15 students doing their masters here, either in Luton or in Hertfordshire. And we have a group for all the master's students. Sister Runke. Okay, from what part? Lincoln. Okay, okay. I have a, do you go to Redeem Church there? Pastor Vera Ichike. Ichike. Okay, she's my very good friend. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, King of glory, we just thank you. Father God, Almighty God, King of kings, Lord of Lord, as we talk about household generation this month, as we break down altars in the household, Father God, help us in the name of Jesus. Anybody going through challenges, household challenges, Father God, it shall be broken in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to ask about two or three people. In the Bible, when we talk about household generation, what names come to mind? Anybody? Anybody? Microphone? What name comes to mind when we talk about household generation? Are you speaking, Severinka? Can you give? Esau and Jacob. We can't hear you. Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob. Okay. Any other person? Any other name comes to mind when we talk about household generation? Okay. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph and his brothers. Okay. Those two are enough. Joseph and his brothers. And that is going to be our focus today. Um, you see, when we research the story of Joseph, we will now realize that that is the kind of household that there must be household generation. Some of us, we come from polygamous homes. And I've, I don't come from a polygamous home, but I'm aware of many people that come from a polygamous home. And I've heard stories about how moms will treat the other children. And I've heard so many stories of that. Uh, the mom will give the child a better food, but the stepchild will be something that is not nice. And we men, if you're a man today and your wife is here today, tell your wife, you are the only one I am going to marry. Is your wife here today? Tell your wife, Brother Kenny. She knows. Clap, clap for him. Clap for him. <laughs> Glad for him. Okay, your wife is not. Where's your wife now? Uh, Gerald, where's your wife? She's hiding. She's with the children. Okay, okay. Let me see who's there with their husband. Okay, many people are not here with their husband. Okay. So tell your husband when you get home that Pastor said you are the only wife you are going to marry. Because when we look at the story of Joseph, the story of the family, from, the, from Jacob, it was so complex. Let us read Genesis 37, 2 to 4. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bila and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an honest robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. First here, we learn about Joseph. He was a baby and favored by Jacob. Parents, do not have a favorite in your child, amongst your children. What did I say? Do not have favorites among your children. You know, when, I, when we started this topic, I told you about my own story as a starting point. You see, I told you about the second school I went and how I, how I got to London. My father brought me to London. And because he was a lawyer, he brought me here to study. He handed me over to a professor to study law. And as he left for Nigeria, I changed 
to go and do business studies. Now, after three years, I qualified. I got a two one. He was excited. He was coming from Nigeria. When he got here, he nearly had a heart attack because his expectation was his first son is a lawyer, just like him. So the two one was meaningless. It did not mean anything. My uncles had to appease my father before he even attended the, um, the um, what do you call it? Graduation. Now, my third sister became a lawyer. But my father favored her more than me in anything. He favored her. So when he died, there were problems. We were only one mama, only one mother. But because of that history of favoritism to my sister, because she studied law, it caused a problem in the family. But let us continue. Please, parents, very, very important. Each parent must love one child more than me. It is natural, but don't ever show it. Don't, you are going to create problems. It could be, those problems could be when you are alive or it could be when you are gone. And those problems you create when you are gone. Huh. The country where I come from in Nigeria, there are many houses there, empty. They cannot sell it. Why? Because they cannot come to a conclusion. Does anybody live in Lagos here? Okay, Ikorodu Road. Do you know Benson? Thos Benson's house. Okay. Thos Benson was a top, top musician. Massive house. Massive. The house was long. But when he died, the house started dilapidating because of conflict. They could not sell it. Nobody could live inside it. That was what the father left behind. And that is what Jacob did here. He favored his son. He even sold him a coat of many colors. But let us look at the story of Jacob. You see, no matter what your background, if God is going to love you, God is going to love you. Jacob wanted to marry Rachel. But Laban, his father, knew that Lee, the first daughter, should be the first one to get married. He now swapped Lee, Jacob thought he was with Lee. Sorry, Jacob thought he was with Rachel, not realizing he was with Lee. Lee now had children, and God blocked the womb of Rachel. And because Jacob loved Rachel so much, Rachel said, sleep with my house help. It doesn't matter. They will have children for you. He slept with two of them. They had children. And God favored Rachel, and Rachel had Joseph. Isn't that a complicated kind of family? You slept with the sister. You slept with the house help. In this world that we are living today, can that happen? Can that happen? Very complicated. And favoritism has become a generational sin in Jacob's house. Favoritism was what started the negative journey of Joseph in this world. Remember Jacob's dad, Isaac, loved Esau more than Jacob. And their mom, Rebecca, loved Jacob more than Esau. Generational wahala, as my brother said. Jacob was a very affluent and rich man. He had four wives. As I told you, Lee, Rachel, and the house helps. Bila and Zilpha. So if he has four wives, how many steps mom does um, Joseph have? Three. So that means Joseph had three steps mom. So you can visualize that kind of household where there were many moms, there were many, many, many children. 
Joseph had ten half brothers and one full brother and one half sister. It was Rachel's firstborn and Jacob's eleventh son. Of all the sons, I said, Joseph preferred him and he sold him this fantastic long coat, which we call a coat of many colors. You see, as it is usual in a bifunctional family like this, it's like a soap opera. Does anybody here used to watch Jerry Springer? Anybody heard of Jerry Springer? You've anybody just wave your hand if you've watched Jerry Springer before. If I, uh, so it's like it's as if it's as if sorry for those who have not watched Jerry Springer, but this is like a soap opera. You can turn this into a movie. Part one, part two, because part one will be what the what the wife did for somebody, part two will be what the son did for somebody, and it will go on and on and on and on. Many step brothers, a coat of many colors. Father had him when he was old, so he had the love for him. And polygamy, in this world we live in today, polygamy leads to jealousy. It leads to insecurity and almost constant conflict amongst the wives. And you see, we men, when God blesses us with a wife. You see, when you look at the stages of marriage, there's a stage there that is called the honeymoon stage. That is the stage where we say, please don't disturb, we'll be on the door for days. Honeymoon stage. That is a world where nobody knows. It's the honeymoon stage. But when you now pass the honeymoon stage, the reality stage now creeps in. Ah! Is this the man I married? Is this the woman I married? But you have married that woman. You must stay in that marriage. Because if you leave that woman and you go to another woman and you have children, you are going to cause conflict among those children. And that is what happened to Jacob here. Jealousy, insecurity, constant conflict amongst the wives, constant conflicts amongst the children, hatred amongst the children. And Jacob was a very passive parent and whose lack of involvement and leadership brought incredible pain and confusion to his family. That is why Joseph's brother took turns to become brutal, conniving, and often at times immoral. But yet, amongst the infighting, amongst the blatant sin, the bad examples and emotional manipulation, there were some spiritual markers that struck the seeking heart of John, young John, young, sorry, young Joseph, and profoundly shaped his future. You know, I say something. It doesn't matter whether you come from a dysfunctional family, you come from a, ma a family where too many wives, too many uh, children. When God, if God is going to be present amongst you there, God will be present. Isn't it the same Jacob that wrestled? Wasn't it him? That wrestled and wrestled. And what happened after wrestling? What happened after wrestling? Change his name to what? To Israel. Wasn't he the same? The man that had a dysfunctional family. Wasn't he the same man that his name was changed to Israel? But you see, favoritism is a threat to our family. Parents are called to love the kids the same. And Jacob being an elderly person, we will have expected him to learn the effect of favoritism upon his family. 
Why didn't he make robes for all his children? Why did he just make one for one child? And that robe was very conspicuous. It was a robe of many colors, a robe that went knee length. And that coat, he must have spent so much time and so much labor in doing that because of the love he had for this young boy. And when this boy, young boy, was sent to the fields, instantly the brothers will have seen his shine, his coat coming from afar. And interestingly, in this story, Jacob's first son, Reuben, slept with one of the uh, house elves that uh, Jacob married. So, in principle, his first son slept with his father's wife. And Jacob never forgave him. Jacob never forgave him. Jacob never forgave Reuben for sleeping with his wife. And this leads to the next, next thing that threatens families. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a threat to families. Unforgiveness is a big threat to families. Jacob never forgave Reuben. And I'm sure in the practicality of it, he will never have spoken to him again. He will have never seen him as his first son ever again. But one of the key things that we need to learn, and I, as I said, when we are burying our brother Chidu, forgiveness, forgiving people is key. You cannot carry unforgiveness around. You cannot do what? You cannot carry unforgiveness around. It causes heartache. It causes high blood pressure. It causes headache. When I have headache, when I'm stressed, it's because I am overworked. It's not because I have somebody that I've, I've not forg forgiven. Or somebody will call my phone and I say, ah, this one, I will not call that person. We must have a heart of forgiveness. And these are things that lead to household generation problems when a set of sisters they have children are those children not to be are they not cousins are they not cousins are they not supposed to love each other but once there's a conflict because between sister a and sister c that conflict will go down to the children and it is not a good thing. It goes deep. It goes deep, deeper and deeper and deeper. And it is not a good thing. We must learn to forgive each other. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. Just as Christ God forgive you. Ephesians 4, 30, 32. When we read Psalm 23, it tells us, sorry, when we read um, the Lord's Prayer, it tells us, forgive each other as you want to be forgiven. Why do we carry so much hate? Why do we, in, in, even amongst our family, there are many of us that don't have, we have sisters, we have brothers, we have uncles that we don't talk to. There are many that we don't talk to. You know, but uh, Joshua, he said, I said something here, which we all laughed about, about putting your picture on your, on your DP and people seeing it. And a gentleman called me, somebody I know in Nigeria, the sister lives here. He was reporting the sister to me. He said, pastor, daddy, do you know 
I have pleaded with my sister to send me money because my landlord has kicked me out. I have even got her to speak to the landlord that I want to move into a new place for my sister to help me out. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You know what uh, the young boy from Nigeria said? He said, Daddy, if you look at my sister's DP every Sunday, every Sunday, the clothes she wears, even if she can use, sell one and send the money, half price of the money, uh, to cover the sister. I said, you know something? You know women, they buy clothes many, many years. In particular, a Christian, they don't have anywhere to wear it to. It's only church. That is, that is why you see her like that. She's dressing up for God. That is, how, that is how I covered up for the sister. I said, she's dressing up for God. I said, that's the reason why you see her in the DP in different, in different uh, clothes every Sunday. Because she loves God. She, I said, no, daddy, no, 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 no. She's just, she's enjoying herself in London and we are suffering back home. And we knew that before she came to London, we were the one that contributed the money for our plane to come to London. You see problems. Now, Joseph, as a young man, he was a dreamer. He had dreams. And when he told his brothers, they hated him even the more. The first thing, first of all, they were not for this, from the same orderly lineage. So that initial hatred was, I don't know how Lee, Rachel, and the two house elves, how they related to each other. I don't know whether there was love amongst them. I don't know. But the children, the stepchildren, they hated him more. Because he said, and behold, your sheep gathered around it and bow down to my sheep. His brother said to him, eh. so that is the dream you had, that our sheep bow down to your own sheep. Okay, okay, don't worry. And they asked him, are you in, the, does that mean that you are going to reign over us? And he said, behold, the sun, the moon, 11 stars were bound down to me. But when he told this to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, he said to him, what is this dream you have dreamed? You have dreamt. Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before thee? You see, that is why I said, no matter what confusion is happening in your household, if God is going to be present there, God will create space. God was already with Joseph. In that house where there was hatred, in that house where there was jealousy, God was already with Joseph. So my brothers and sisters, wherever you find yourselves, God will always be with you. Whatever situation you find yourself, God will forever be present with you. You see, I use myself as an example when I first heard this story. And I'm going, back, going to go back again. My mother... As, an, as a firstborn, I had a fantastic relationship. I was closer to my mom. Closer to my mom, 100%. Because my dad was a, my dad disciplined me, which I thank God for today. He took me to where I am. But when they were both over their 70s, 75 and all that, and one day I was just saying to myself, if any one of them is going to die first, I pray that my dad dies first. Not my mom. Not that they should die, you, but I'm saying if either, it should be my dad, not my mom. But as God did it, my mom died first. So when my mom died, and my mom's village to my dad's village is literally seven miles. When my mom died, she was buried in my father's village because 
they created the space for my when my father dies they created the space for him so they buried my mom so the people in my mother's village they were angry why because when we were bringing the corpse the body from akure we brought the body from lagos i came from london i followed the body from before the days of boko haram i thought i took the body being the firstborn took the body from Lagos Mortuary to Akure Mortuary. And then, when we were going, my father planned the detour, how we were going to go. And somebody said, why don't we go through my mom's village just to honor them? Because she was well known in the village. Just to honor them, and then we go back. And my father said, there's no need for that. That if they want to come to the funeral, they should come to our village. Come and see anger. The king of my mom's village sent um, about seven people to my dad that he has questions to answer. Come and see. They, were, they had to be appeased with money. And I don't think that appeasement went down very well. So that is why we need to be very careful what, how we do things. When you have unforgiveness, it leads to hatred. Hate. And hate is a threat to the family. And when we read the scripture, some times passed, and Joseph was sent by his father to check on his brother who was shipping, uh, who was shepherding uh, Jacob's flock. And from there, things went from bad to worse. They saw him from afar. They saw his multicolored coat that his father stood for him. And they conspired against him. Not to kidnap him, but to kill him. Same father, different moms. That is the challenge that this causes. I know some people that have traveled abroad, they will not tell their brother, they will not tell their sister until they get to this England. Ah, you know, this thing just came by emergency. You, uh, I just got tickets before I, before I close my eyes. I landed in London, and the sister will say, eh, That is how you landed in London. So, you didn't go for visa, you didn't go for visa meeting. Am I stupid? Because you thought that uh, I will be the one that will winch your, your plane down. Because trust, trust. A woman will be pregnant and the family will be seen, ah, you look pregnant. No, no ma, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the food I'm eating, ma. I'm not pregnant, ma. Because we don't trust each other. There's no trust. But children of God, there's one key thing I'm going to tell you here. This confused family from the beginning, God was present. God was what? God was present. And the dream that gentleman Joseph had, that dream he had, it was a real dream. It was the dream that God showed to her. Show, sorry, show to him. It was the dream that God showed to him. Though Joseph's current family was dysfunctionary, it was in a mess, the legacy of those who had gone before him was unmistakable. Joseph stood in the long shadow of, of, the God, of, of Godly. Joseph stood in the shadow of God. And you see the thing is, when you have a cycle of dysfunction in the family, it's like sickness in a family. They will say the mom died at age 60 of breast cancer. The daughter died at age 59 of breast cancer. And the young daughter, the grandchild died at age 28 of breast cancer. That is a cycle that we must break. 
One of our close friends, she's going to be buried this Friday, died recently. And I have known her for many, many years. And I remember in those days when her mom died, she was about 58. She died of breast cancer. This sister too will be about 56, 57. She just died of breast cancer. We must be very prayerful to break this evil cycle. We must be very, very prayerful to break this evil cycle. I'm not going to go into the story of Joseph. We know the story of Joseph. But what I'm trying to tell you here is, no matter how dysfunctional your family is, no matter what challenges you are having in your homes, God is present there. God is present there. Whatever challenges you are having, because we have many students here, I think uh, Sister Patience, she said she had a test or an exam and she did, she did not even know what to write. But when she, just, when she started writing, God was with her. She came out was with 60 something. First Peter 4, 12, 3, 13 tells us, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fairy trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You are the Joseph of your family. You are what? The Joseph of your family. No matter what kind of family you have come from, no matter what kind of brothers or sisters you have come from, God is saying today that you are the Joseph of your family. And because you are the Joseph of your family, God is going to open doors for you in the name of Jesus. The mistakes that your father has done, you know, Jacob passed. He's made so many mistakes. Yes. But the mistakes your fathers have done, the mistakes that your mothers have done, tends to cause household wickedness. It tends to cause household how can I say it again, apart from wickedness? That is where household jealousy, that is where they create what we call household altars. And sometimes, you might say you are a Christian, but many of us Christians in this country, we are not real Christians. Our priorities are not right. On um, Friday, what day did we bury Brother Chidu? Friday. Sister Princess and Sister Vivian, they're not here now. When we finished the, when we finished the service before the burial, they were supposed to go back to the hall, to arrange the hall. They could not get a taxi. You know why? There was a Muslim celebration going on. And they, all the taxis, they called, they said, sorry, we are busy now. We are busy with our uh, Muslim whatever, whatever. Prayer time. And we're busy with our prayer time. If you want a taxi, it will have, it will have to be at 2 o'clock. But we Christians, our priority, look at the church. Look how empty the church is. If our members are here today, we'll be getting extra chairs. Why? Because of work. Because of work. And the reality of life is, many of us, we work, we work, we work, we work. And at the end of the day, we don't see anything for it. That will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. That will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. As I said, I won't go into the story of Joseph because we know the story of Joseph. But what we are talking about today is any kind of family that you have come from, you are the Joseph of that family. God Almighty is present in your life in the name of Jesus. And God will continue to uphold you in the name of Jesus. Many of us this year, it has not been a good year. January, we prayed into January. Challenges, February challenges, March, April, May, June, July. It's always from one challenge to the other. But I'm telling you today that you will be an overcomer in the name of Jesus. God Almighty will bless you in Jesus' name. Because of our time, can we just take two or three prayers and then we conclude. Let us just stand up to pray. 
We're going to pray that God Almighty, we pray for your divine intervention to resolve all our problems in our family that we are facing presently in the name of Jesus. Maybe problems with your sisters, problems with your in-laws, problems with your wife, problems with your husband, problems with your mother, your father. Father God, we pray for your divine intervention to resolve all the problems in the name of Jesus. Father Lord, resolve all the problems in the name of Jesus. Whatever problems we are having in our families, Father God, let it be resolved in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord my God, let it be resolved in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to pray that Lord Almighty, Father, heal and strengthen each member of our family so that we will have the courage to forgive and move on with our lives as one united family in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord Almighty God, heal our relationship with our family. Father God, let us have the courage to forgive, to forgive and move on in the name of Jesus. Father God, we shall move on. We shall move on in the name of Jesus. Father God, blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everlasting King of Glory, we just thank you. Father God, guide our family in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray for a vibrant family in the name of Jesus. Help us to edify each other and to avoid hurting each other in the name of Jesus. Father God, you are the strong deliverer. We ask you to deliver us from our dysfunctional family in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father Lord, uphold our family in the name of Jesus. Amen. Whatever challenges are in family, Father God, we will be the starting point to sort things out in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, you have made us the Joseph of our family. Father God, open our eyes in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, blessed be your holy name. You, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.